The Drew Gooden channel is filmed in front of a live studio audience. <laughs> hey guys. Not that funny. So you may know I'm not the biggest fan of laugh tracks. A couple years ago, I made a video called Efficiency in Comedy, where I not only complained about how unnatural the sound of canned laughter feels while watching a show, but I also tested a theory I had had for a long time, which is that laugh tracks don't just grate my ears and make me roll my eyes, but they also lessen the amount of jokes you can fit in a show by creating dead space in between lines. So when I took an episode of Friends, for example, and edited out all the segments where no one was talking because it was the audience's turn to make noise, it worked out to be over five minutes long. And when the entire episode is is only 21 minutes, that means you're looking at about a quarter of it having no substance at all. And I know that comedy is not a race, it's not about having the most jokes, it's about having good jokes. If the goal was just to fit as many jokes as you could into like 10 seconds, you would just say them all at the same time. And something tells me that wouldn't work very well. So that idea kept eating away at me until I finally took on the experiment. Two episodes of Friends, two episodes of The Office, one pen and paper, three cups of coffee, one mental breakdown, and a whole lot of pressing pause. Once I was done, I counted up all the jokes and was able to determine that yes, in fact, the show without laugh tracks had more jokes per minute, which means my hypothesis was correct and comedy is now objective thanks to Matt. All right, good night, everyone. Except not really, because I wasn't very thorough. I chose two random episodes of two different shows to try and prove my point, and I don't think that was enough. Every time I think back on that video, I think about an idea that I was really excited to test, but I kind of half-assed my way into the conclusion that I wanted to have from the beginning. So I decided to do this again, but bigger. Six different shows, three episodes per show, 12 cups of coffee, and about seven hours of my life I'll never get back. Here's how it went. I didn't just want to choose more shows this time, I also wanted to try and pick different types of shows. It's the same two categories as before, but I feel like there's some differentiation within each one. So let's start with Parks and Rec. It wouldn't be fair to say that Parks and Rec is underrated, but I do still feel like it's underappreciated because it will forever be stuck in the shadow of its older, more popular cousin. Like The Office, Parks and Rec was an NBC mockumentary that has continued to thrive due to its second life on Netflix, something I actually contribute partly to reaction gifts on the internet. The characters in this show are so strong that you can look at a silent, moving image of Ron Swanson without ever having watched an episode and know exactly who he is. And now you gotta know more about this guy, so you might as well watch all 126 episodes. Add in a bunch of home run casting choices and a perfectly satirized fictional town and you end up with one of the funniest shows I've ever watched. Because of the fast pace of Parks and Rec, I expected to have the most jokes per episode of any of the ones on the list, but we'll see. I use two different random number generators to pick the episodes I'll be watching, which is what I'll be doing for the rest of the shows as well. Up next, Malcolm in the Middle. When I was like nine, my parents came home one day with season one of the show on DVD. I didn't want to watch it because for some reason my dumb kid brain got this confused with Miracle in Lane 2, a Disney Channel movie where Frankie Muniz rolls down a hill. Luckily, that's not what the DVD was, and we did watch it, and I fell in love. For the next few years, I would re-watch these episodes over and over again, wishing I could somehow watch the rest of the show, because I guess I was too stupid to realize they were still airing it on TV. I always thought my parents were lying when they said they couldn't buy season two on DVD, but years later, I found out it was never released. Turns out it would have cost Fox too much money to pay for the music licenses from the show, and so after the first season, they never even bothered. Anyway, I watched season one when I was nine, and reruns of season two through seven in high school. This show is so good, even in spite of the fact that one third of every episode feels like a weak distraction that's sometimes hard to get invested in. Don't get me wrong, I loved Francis as a character, and I loved when he would come home and have interactions with the rest of the family, but in some episodes, it's tempting to just fast forward through whatever he's got going on. I think the reason this show stands out so much is because it wasn't about a perfect family where things always work out. It's about these realistic, flawed characters who butt heads and end up in believably bad situations. A lot of the time, the humor comes from how things don't work out, even when it seemed like they would. That being said, I feel like Malcolm in the Middle was more of a slow burn rather than an onslaught of punchlines, so I'm curious to see how many jokes there are in here compared to the rest of the shows. The final single camera show I'm including is Shit's Creek. The reason I'm choosing this one is because I've never watched it. I feel like if I only chose shows I loved, then I might come off as biased, and the whole point of this is to try and do the opposite. The only thing I know about Schitt's Creek is that one time they paid me $500 to make a vine about it, 
but then everyone who did one had to post it on the same day and it was a total disaster. But hopefully the show is good. Seems like a great cast, so I have pretty high expectations. All right, moving on to multicams. Let's start with the one that I think stands out most on this list, the IT crowd. Hello. Well, I guess it doesn't actually stand out that much. It's just the only British show on here. And that makes it different. It's also probably the most conceptually simple out of all the shows on here. It's just three people who work in an IT department and sometimes they do things. The season two premiere is probably my favorite episode of any show ever. The way the writers weaved each story together so that every character's plotline builds individually, but then they all collide at the end in the most beautiful way, it is art. It's one of the rare times in my life that I didn't actually mind the studio audience laughing along and applauding at the end because it felt so earned. I think the most memorable episodes of TV have this long, slow crescendo from start to finish, and the IT crowd usually perfected that. Up next, How I Met Your Mother. How I Met Your Mother premiered around the time when single camera shows were starting to have more success, and I think the general population was just about ready to move on from the old format. Because of that, the show feels like it has a foot in the door of both. It is technically a multi-camera sitcom, but the laugh track is really quiet and not too intrusive. It's like the studio audience is just whispering in the corner, like, don't worry guys, we're still here, but we're gonna keep it down. I haven't watched this show since it first aired, but I really enjoyed it at the time. They were definitely going for like a Modern Friends vibe, and I think they do a pretty good job. Like every successful show, the reason How I Met Your Mother worked so well is because the writing is good and the characters are very well cast. I don't know if I'll enjoy it as much as I used to, but I guess I'll find out. Finally, The Big Bang Theory. That's right, baby, I brought out the big guns. What, you thought I would make a video about laugh tracks and not talk about the smash mouth of sitcoms? You were dead wrong. Often regarded as the pinnacle of both entertainment as well as humankind, The Big Bang Theory is a show about nerd and hot girl and how those things make them different. I'm actually kind of excited to watch a few episodes of the show because it has so much lore around it at this point that I'm thinking there's no way it lives up to its reputation. Surely I'll laugh a few times, right? Regardless of how I feel about the joke, so I'm anticipating quite a bit of them. They might actually pull off an upset considering how often the studio audience starts going apeshit. So this is probably a good time to talk about the scoring system real quick. That was another thing I don't think I clarified well enough when I did this originally. I just started counting jokes all willy-nilly without ever defining what I viewed as a joke. So for multicams, it's pretty straightforward. If the audience laughs, a joke has been made. Every once in a while, something flies under the radar, but my thought process is if a choice was made by the writers that was meant to elicit a laugh, it counts as a joke. Sometimes lines have more than one joke in them because of the way they're worded. Sometimes a facial reaction or a body movement counts as a joke. It really just depends on the situation. If it's a show without a laugh track, I just try to imagine where the laughs would be inserted if there was. I am voting for you. You're not voting for yourself? I say you can't vote for yourself, I don't think. I'm pretty sure that's illegal. <laughs> that's so funny. Keep in mind, if you don't like my scoring system, you're more than welcome to try this out yourself. All you have to do is whip out a notebook and take all the fun out of watching TV. Best part of the video coming up, I'm about to say a bunch of numbers. So in Parks and Rec, first episode, I counted 133 jokes in 21 minutes, then 169 jokes in 27 minutes, and then 113 in 23 minutes. I had to re-roll for the last episode because I didn't realize at first that the one I landed on initially was twice as long as a usual episode, and I don't got time for that. Anyway, from those three episodes, that's an average of 5.8 jokes per minute. Malcolm in the Middle actually had the best out of any show. It's just a testament to how well written it is that they're able to jam so many jokes in there without you even realizing it sometimes. So I counted 131 jokes, then 122, then 133, all the episodes are 21 minutes, that's 6.1 jokes per minute on average. And then Shit's Creek uh, kind of let me down, both numerically and also it just wasn't as funny as I thought it would be. It's very similar to Arrested Development plot-wise. Um, it's a rich family who lost their fortune and now has to adjust to normal life. But where Arrested Development has this wide cast of varying characters, I feel like everybody in Schitt's Creek is just kind of the same person. Still pretty funny though, I laughed a few times. I like the little visual gags here and there, like them struggling with these giant menus in the pilot episode. But this one was the lowest out of the three. I counted 111, 104, and then 112, all the episodes are 21 minutes, that's 5.2 jokes per minute. If you then average those three numbers together, that's about 5.7 jokes per minute in the three single camera shows that I watched. So now the show's with a laugh track. Starting with IT Crowd, I counted 110 jokes in 23 minutes, 137 jokes in 24 minutes, and then 106 jokes in 22 minutes. How I Met Your Mother ended up being the slowest paced show out of all of them. I counted 93, then 100, then 103, all the episodes are 21 minutes long, so that's about 4.7 jokes per minute. And then finally, The Big Bang Theory, uh, as I predicted before, did have a lot of jokes per episode. I counted 92 in 18 minutes, 114 in 20 minutes, and then 104 in 19 minutes. So average of 5.4 jokes per minute, better than Shit's Creek, at least in terms of volume, but still not enough to bring the average of multicams 
up uh, works out to be about five jokes per minute. So I guess all that time I spent watching these episodes and smelling this Sharpie because I couldn't find a regular pen was not put to waste because now it's slightly stronger statistical evidence of what I tried to prove like two years ago. I think my biggest takeaway though is that the Big Bang Theory does have a lot of jokes. So I guess it's well written. All right, I got to rant about this shit. Watch this scene. Water demon. Ice dragon. Lesser warlord of Ka'a. <laughs> That's four laugh tracks and not a single joke was made. I feel like so much of the show is just nerdy guy is saying a science thing and it's funny because of how nerdy it sounds. And look, I laughed a few times during the show. It's not that all of the writing is terrible. Here's a joke I thought was really funny. Babe, open up. I'm not talking to you. And who are you talking to? It's just the constant laughing at nothing that drives me crazy. And I think that's a big reason why people are so turned off by laugh tracks. They're so overused in shows like this that it's hard to trust what you're actually watching. It's like boy who cried laugh. You keep telling me something funny happened, but I don't see it. And then by the time something funny actually does happen, I don't believe it. The Big Bang Theory ran for 12 seasons and it was on the air for so long that by the time it ended, TV culture had completely changed. There seem to be way fewer sitcoms made like this anymore. Hell, even their spinoff show, Young Sheldon, is shot in a completely different format. It's more narrative focused. There's no studio audience. It's actually insane to me that it spawned from this. Hey. I brought Chinese. And I brought Indian. <laughs> Even without my weird dumb math exercise, I think the general population has been subconsciously catching on to this for a while and is just not as interested in this kind of sitcom anymore. In fact, when I think back to some of the funniest shows that I've watched recently, a lot of them aren't even like straightforward comedies. Certain HBO shows like Barry and Silicon Valley, they're super funny and they're filled with comedic actors, but they also have this really compelling story going on in the background of all the jokes. Actually, the hardest I think I've laughed at a show recently is in Success which is this insanely well-written series with plot twists and these brutal backstabbing moments. And then there's this randomly hilarious scene with Greg and Tom that I can't play or this video would get age restricted. And I think maybe that's where we as an audience have slowly shifted over the past couple decades. I can't speak for everyone obviously because everybody has their own individual taste. But for me, there's something much more satisfying about the juxtaposition of emotional depth followed by jokes that break the tension. Good punchlines are important, but in order for you to actually care about what's going on, you need to get invested in the characters and their lives. Even in shows like Parks and Rec that have these relentlessly silly moments, they'll sometimes follow those up with a much more serious scene to flesh out the characters on an emotional level. Like watching this one episode, I'm sitting here counting joke after joke after joke, and then all of a sudden, there's a shift where the last minute or so, there's hardly any joke. Leslie wins the city council race that she's been on for the entire season up until that point, and so she gives this nice speech about how she couldn't have done it without the hard work of all her friends. They even have a great little detail in there where they show the part where she starts going off script and just speaking from the heart. And it ends up being this really nice heartwarming moment that grounds an otherwise absurd show. And I think that's ultimately what keeps me coming back. Uh, you want to be invested in what's going on in the universe because when you are, all of the jokes are going to hit harder. To bring up Parks and Rec one last time, there's another really good scene in that episode where Leslie is having this conflicting moment because she's fulfilling a lifelong dream, but she also just found out her boyfriend might take a job that puts him several hundred miles away. You can feel the emotion on her face, you can empathize with her, and then Paul Rudd comes in to break the tension. Let's see, I can't figure this thing out. Can you help me? Yeah, just hang on a second, Bobby. That ink all over my hands, and the pen thingy came off the chain. And to me, at least, the most memorable shows strike that perfect balance between funny, but also compelling. There's always still gonna be a place for more straightforward comedy shows with constant, shallow punchlines. It really just depends on what mood you're in. Sometimes you just wanna laugh at something dumb. Sometimes you don't wanna watch a show with emotional depth, because it's like, I got my own shit going on, and now I gotta care about these fictional characters, too. It's interesting to me the way that television has slowly shifted away from the traditional sitcom. When you look at what's on TV right now, CBS is really the only major network with shows that still have laugh tracks in them. The other thing I notice a lot of these shows have in common is they almost all feature an old random actor who's been around for a very long time. Matt LeBlanc, Patricia Heaton, Cedric the Entertainer. CBS's approach is so clearly like, we're gonna make shows with actors that you recognize from other shows using the same format 
of those shows. We realize our target demographic is people who hate change, and there's no point in trying to tailor to this new generation of people who's going to be more interested in Netflix and TikTok no matter what we do. Laugh tracks are hanging on by a thread, and I don't think it'll be much longer before we look back on this era like, hey, isn't that kind of weird that we used to do that? But like a lot of things in life, it made sense for a long time, and then eventually it didn't. People change, pop culture evolves, it's inevitable. I don't know about you guys, but the show Friends has taken on a brand new role in my life in that the only time I watch it is when I'm trying to fall asleep. There's something about the static, predictable rhythm of sitcom audio at a very low volume that puts my mind at ease. So I guess that's all I really have to say about this topic. Uh, though the other thing that drives me crazy about TV is the constant commercial breaks. Every time you get invested in what's happening, they cut to someone else who tries to sell you shit. And I hate it. The Drew Gooden Channel will return after a word from our sponsor. Hi. I'm depressed, but you may know me as founder and CEO of PictureOfHotDog.com, a website that was recently featured on Forbes' Top 1 Under 1 list. For the past several months, people have been raving about the delicious toppings available on my site, from mustard to pickle to basketball. We have options spanning almost none of the food groups. But through all the praise, one demand has remained consistent. The hot dog is simply in desperate need of a makeover. So I gave it one. Click the Make It Beautiful button to go see just how stunning this wiener can truly be. But Drew, you're dumb. How did you make a website? Well, I'll tell you. I used Squarespace. Squarespace. I believe it was Aristotle who once said that deep down everybody has a great idea for a website. And although I obviously just made that up, he would have had a pretty good point if he did. Squarespace is an easy to use all-in-one platform that'll help you turn your idea into a reality without any coding experience necessary. It's as simple as selecting a template from one of their great options and then just tweaking things from there until you're satisfied. You don't even have to worry about adjusting it for cell phone users either because each template comes with a mobile optimized version automatically. Whether your site is a landing page for your portfolio or a storefront that helps you profit off your work, Squarespace has every tool you could possibly need to make a website that looks and functions exactly the way you need it to. For about a year, I used to sell my own merch on a website I made with Squarespace, and it was a super seamless experience the entire time. They partner with ShipStation, which is a service that allowed me to print shipping labels in bulk and checked them off as I went, which saved me literally hours of work. You can set up multiple different payment methods and accepted currencies, and you can even have your customers create accounts so they can check out faster in the future, and so you can connect with them about any sales or new products you have that they might be interested in. These are just a few of their many great features, but I promise you, if you're trying to make a website, Squarespace is gonna help you do it. To get started with a seven day free trial, head to squarespace.com, and when you're ready to launch your brand new website, use promo code DREW for 10% off your first purchase. Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video, and now you guys may go Check out my new beautiful hot dog. I know you're dying to see it. It's a good thing commercials are only on TV and not on the internet. Well, guys, thank you so much for watching today's video. It means a lot that you're willing to look at and or listen to me for about 10 to 20 minutes at a time. Be sure to tune in next week for a video where I do the same exact exercise as I did in this one, only instead of sitcoms, I go back and count all the jokes in my own YouTube video. Not to spoil anything, but I hear the number ends up being so much lower than I was hoping that it makes me cry and I quit making YouTube videos forever. <laughs> all right, see you then.